Hey everyone, this is a video describing our details from Chapter 4, Ecosystems and Communities. In this presentation, we're mainly going to stick with the community level interactions as that will be on our next test. So as we've been talking about ecology, we know that ecology is broken down into many different parts. We've stayed at the basic level of individual, population, and now we're at the community level, which takes a look at all of the living things within an area. So in this little picture, you have a moose, you have a whatever that is, you have a rabbit, you have a beaver. Um, so how those living things interact with each other. Populations was just taking a look at one specific species. So here they're taking a look at an elk. And then as we continue to learn about ecology, we'll get into the ecosystem and biome level. Here's just kind of another slide showing you the same thing and, uh, and what that looks like. So relationship and the relationships with organisms have been going on for a really long time. Sometimes the association is so strong that they will actually adapt and evolve to each other. We see this a lot in pollinators and the flowers that they pollinate. So the picture on the right is a moth and then what's called a yucca plant where the radula, which is like the tongue of the moth, can get into the deep pocket of this flower, get its nectar where a lot of other insects are either too big and can't fit or don't have a long enough radula to actually get into the nectar area. So coevolution is something that happens when the relationship between the two creatures is, is really, really strong. Symbiotic means a close association with any two creatures. These relationships can be a variety, including parasitism, where you have one organism that benefits and the other one is negatively impacted. So here you're seeing a mosquito on a human arm. The picture on the right is a caterpillar that has little mites that are growing on it. And with parasites, they don't want to kill their host. They are not uh, real active creatures. They like to stay with the host that they have. And when they dissociate from the host, then they have to go to try and find another one. And we kind of describe how parasites are somewhat lazy in that regard. Mutualism is a plus slash plus relationship. That's where both organisms benefit. And so here again, we see the monarch butterfly and a flower. The picture on the right shows a gazelle and what's called an oxpecker that will actually eat the insects off the back of a lot of uh, Sahara or um, savanna dwelling creatures. I shouldn't say Sahara, savanna. And that's a relationship where the oxbow bird benefits from eating the flies. And then the, in this case, gazelle benefits because it gets cleaned up and doesn't have ticks or any other flies buzzing around it. So it's a mutualistic relationship. Commensalism is one of the rare ones. That's where you have one organism that benefits and the other one doesn't really care. So here you're seeing a remora that's swimming underneath this larger fish and will kind of clean up the scraps as well as seek protection from other fish. And the big fish doesn't really care what's going on. A bird building a nest in a tree. Here you're seeing a bluebird nest in a spruce tree. Spruce doesn't care because it's not negatively impacted. It doesn't benefit it. And so it's a plus slash n, n being for neutral. Our next relationship that we have is predation, and that is the act of killing or consuming another for food. This doesn't always have to be blood, guts, and gore. It can be another word called herbivory, and that is where something like a caterpillar or insect will browse on some of the um, plant, but it doesn't kill it completely. It's able to reestablish itself. And so a lot of times herbivory happens when you just take part of the plant, but it's able to actually survive. So predation, just a quick recap, prey is the one that gets eaten. So the rabbit here, the grass, the fish, the predator is what does the eater. The red fox in this case, the bald eagle in this case, and then the sheep in this case. So predation is a relationship that we see. Some of our prop, top predators are very important in what we call population control. Competition. When two species interact over some needed resource, intraspecific is within the same species. So a male lion and a male lion competing for a lioness mate. Interspecific is among species. So you have a rabbit and squirrel that might compete over the same diet. And so it can be anything like a food source. It could be a watering hole, nesting site, light if we're talking about plants, nutrients if we're talking about plants. And so remember, it's not just animals that go through competition, but everything in biology goes through competition. Because competition takes place, sometimes creatures take desperate measures in order to stay alive. So our examples of defense mechanisms that we have, camouflage, where something blends into its surroundings, 
Mimicry, where something that's not lethal will try to copy something that is lethal. Plain dead or some other type of habits or like a cobra will sometimes get uh, a hood and look bigger than it actually is. And then chemical defenses are what we see with like poison ivy. It's what we see with black walnuts and how they will release things into the soil so that stuff doesn't grow under them. And remember that biology, two main goals, to stay alive and to reproduce. Finally, if enough of that competition happens and things start to occupy the same niche, niches like the job or the role, then you can get what's called competitive exclusion, where a species will no longer survive in that area because there's too many that are doing the same thing. And this idea goes back to chapter 16 with survival of the fittest, where just those ones that are best suited to survive, that all compete, those genes are going to continue, where some things that don't have good genes or a species that isn't competitive enough, they're not going to be in that area anymore. And so niche is just a fancy word to describe what the job is of that creature. So if we have red squirrels and gray squirrels, they can live together in the same area, but it's because they occupy different niches. Gray squirrels typically live at the tops of trees, where uh, red squirrels, they like to find a hollowed out hole in the tree, and they'll live there, and they're more ground dwellers because they're eating on those spruce cones that have fallen to the ground. So a niche is a job that they have. Succession is a predictable pattern in which species are replaced when a place gets disturbed in some way or when a place first starts off. You got to start off somewhere. And so primary succession is where there was no life there before. Essentially, it's starting from square zero. Things like lichen, moss, and other plants that don't require a lot of nutrients are what we call pioneer species. So they're going to show up first. And then eventually, that's going to give way to some other larger grasses, maybe even some shrubbery that still doesn't need a lot of creatures or a lot of uh, nutrients, excuse me. And then, depending on where the climax of the area is, you can sometimes have a grassland stay a grassland, or the number one factor that makes things happen is precipitation. You can get forest. And so, when we look at different ecosystems and biomes coming up in future chapters, We'll talk about some of those abiotic factors that influence uh, an area's potential. Pioneer species, as mentioned, are those first things to take over an area. They really get the soil formation process happening. So here in the picture, you're seeing some lichen, some mosses, some hornworts, some liverworts that are able to establish on the area pretty quick. So primary succession, there is no life there before. It's starting from zero. Volcanic um, explosion, eruptions, glacial receding. Two plates that are going apart where there's no life there before soil, it's starting from zero. It takes a really, really long time to establish soil. Secondary is much, much more popular. We see this with disturbances. We see this with natural disasters where there is soil there. There is some seed bank that's there, but it's kind of starting over from the ground up, essentially. So that's called succession. Our last thing that we'd like to talk about in this chapter are predator-prey relationships. So these are relationships that have been going on historically for a really long time. This first one is actually called a competition curve. And so what happens is, depending on what amount of species you have, just understand that it's not just one versus the other. There can be other impacts. We watched a video where we looked at moose wolf population, but we also got to understand that it's not just the moose and wolves. In that video, we looked at beaver. We looked at the spruce tree and how that changed the whole complexity of the area as well. And here you're seeing a couple different kinds of bacteria where you have Bursaria and you have Argenta. They're competing. Argenta is winning. Bursaria is losing. But then another kind of bacteria, Caudatum, is introduced. That one seems to be the top competitor. And when it does that, Argenta goes down and now Bursaria is able to do better. So we just got to understand that depending on what species, it's not just a predator versus a prey, but other things that also will influence a population. So the number one case study that's used by almost every textbook and talked about every biology teacher ever is the Isle Royale that's happening in Lake Superior, where they're looking at the moose population versus the wolf population. And that is a case study where they look at the fluctuations. What we see typically is what's called a cyclical relationship, an up and down but we also have to understand that there's many factors that go into that up and downness. These are not the true numbers of Isle Royale. This just kind of give you a look. The prey population, always higher than the predator. 
what we could add to this is maybe what the beaver population would look like, what the coyote population would look like, how the plant life would be influenced by the amount of moose that are there. And so again, all of these things interact with each other and that's why we call this community ecology. All living things and the relationships that they have with each other and how the number of one doesn't just impact the number of the other, but how all of these things are interconnected with, the, with each other. And that's what we'll learn about coming up, but also adding some of those abiotic factors, things like sunlight, rain, weather, all those abiotic factors can also influence those numbers. Thanks for listening. And that concludes our presentation on community level ecology.